Okay. We're going to talk about CO2 this morning. Uh, thanks for showing up. And uh, so um, it was hard for me to try to get this all in 45 minutes. So this is going to be a, a about a 35,000 foot view, if you will. Um, so I tried to make it as smooth as possible to transition into regulations and CO2. There's going to be some sections at the end, maybe five or six slides. If we can get into the architecture, I put a few slides in at the end. If not, maybe we can pick it up some other time. So as Julie said, I am, uh, I am, well, now I'm having trouble moving forward. Um, if you just hit your space bar. Yes. That should advance or it could just, um, why don't you click anywhere on the screen? Uh, the yes. Like, and then there, there you go. Okay. Okay. So again, I'm Don Gillis. I've been with Emerson just under three years. I do all education. I'm mean, uh, just uh, solely an instructor. Uh, I, I've been a contractor most of my life. Um, I am a licensed journeyman, and obviously I have an EPA card and so uh, a few other things. So um, the agenda today is going to be some history of natural refrigerants. Some of this is probably going to be a refresher. Some of this might be totally new to you. We're going to talk about refrigerant regulations. Jen Bush uh, sent me some up-to-date uh, slides from CARB out in California. I also had a CARB representative reach out to me this morning, and so I tweaked some of the slides with the latest and greatest dates. Uh, we're going to talk about safety procedures and handling and, and basic terminology. And, and uh, from traveling around the U.S., this is what I find where Everybody is starved for information on CO2. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that are getting involved in CO2, California, New York especially, um, they're out there on the job and learning as they go. So when we come in, they're really, you know, they're just starting from square one. So I've noticed that sometimes the best place to start, as simple as it sounds, is just some of the terminology, pressures and temperatures and what they're going to see. Okay, so let's start with regulations. Uh, natural refrigerants started, as most of you probably know, at the turn of the century uh, with the uh, invention of CFC R12-502, uh, which, by the way, R12 was actually developed in Sydney, Ohio, uh, by Frigidaire and, 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 uh, and uh, released by DuPont. Uh, we got into a better world and let go of the natural refrigerants. Um, somewhere around the mid to late 80s, we ran into what we call the Montreal Protocol. In fact, when I was studying for my EPA, that's all I had to, you know, I just devolved, uh, devoured that, uh, absorbed everything I could to take those tests. And a lot of guys when we're in the classroom will, will giggle. They remember that time frame. But what we were trying to do or what they were trying to do is to uh, get that ozone uh, depleting, that chlorine, if you will, in the refrigerants to uh, lessen itself. So we moved into somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, the HCFC R22, for example, and uh, it still had some chlorine in it, but it was better than it was before. And as we tried to get the ozone hold down, um, we started to move into HFCs. I remember taking my test for like 410A when that came out. Um, uh, then we had to, we knew that there was issues. The scientists knew that there was issues at the time but there was such a push to get rid of that chlorine and get that ozone hole down, if you will, that they wanted to get something out there. So they came up with the 404A, the 507s, 134A, 410A. Quite honestly, uh, from what history tells us, we were just buying time. Uh, now we ran into uh, the global warming potential. Uh, then when I think of the two, I think of ozone depletion, I think of skin cancer. When i teaching this in class, I try to give them visuals because this isn't their, their wheelhouse. I know that as a contractor, this is the farthest thing from the mind. In fact, my oldest son, uh, my 34-year-old, is a licensed journeyman too, and I don't even talk with him about it uh, for fear that I might overwhelm him, to be honest with you. Uh, before this all started, uh, Europe had what they called the F-gas regulations in 2006 and then updated in 2014. They were already on track to start to get rid of this stuff. In fact, Europe is about 17 years ahead of us. Canada is approximately about five years ahead of us as far as uh, with natural refrigerants and stuff. Uh, we're quickly catching up on that. Uh, so that's where we, we go into it. So this, this slide I slid in there 
just to give you a visual. Again, ozone depletion, or ODP as we talk about it in class, the abbreviation of, is the hole, which by the way, um, from all the readings, I get a lot of trade magazines sent to the house monthly, and uh, that hole, if you if you read up on it, is actually almost completely closed. It's about 80-some percent, I think, or fairly close to. The global warming potential is the heat. Obviously, the sun is a radiant heat. It bounces off the earth. And it doesn't heat anything. I put a lot of radiant heaters in through my life, and the nice thing about that is they don't heat the air, so it's not wasted. It only heats when it hits something, a body or a or an object, okay? So that's what it's doing with Earth. A lot of that heat bounces off the Earth and with the global warming potential of the refrigerants in the atmosphere, it traps it like a bubble. So the best analogy I've heard is like from uh, um, um, Dr. Allgood from Comores. He said, think about it as a car. You know, the car's sitting outside, it's 85 degrees outside. Uh, the sun's beating through that windshield and the air inside that car uh, is a lot hotter than the air outside the car. And that's kind of a good analogy for what's going on, on the earth. Therefore, hence the name, the greenhouse effect, okay, that bubble. And the higher the global warming potential, the, 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 the longer it takes to break up, okay? So this is the refrigerant regulations that are coming. It's not if, but when. This is actually a new slide that I just got from Jen uh, yesterday. Um, from her presentation, her and Rajan's uh, presentation this week, okay? And this is it, this is uh, part of the Kigali Amendment, and the Kigali Amendment is nothing more than an amendment on the pro uh, Montreal Protocol. It is an amendment uh, to phase down, not phase out, HFCs. If you look at the dark blue line to the far left over there, okay, this is what this was actually the uh, the F gas regulations that they already had in process. Uh, the, 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 the lighter blue or the darker blue um, is Canada and U.S. And basically what this is telling you without going through everything here is, is the, the main objective was to get everybody to sign up by 2050 to phase down to 10% of their usage of what they use now from 100%, okay? You notice some of these countries, uh, India, Iran, Pakistan, they have a lot longer time to get down there. And people ask, why is that? Why are they given that? Well, their infrastructure isn't set up as well as ours to get down there. The main objective was just to get the countries to sign it, okay? So that's what that is. Again, Kigali Amendment is just an amendment off of the Montreal Protocol. And the Kigali Amendment, uh, the way I teach this is, 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 is because again, this isn't the wheelhouse contractors live in, it's an amendment, it's that part of what the Paris Accord that we backed out of it, President Trump did, uh, right, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't get into that, that end of it, but that's the Kigali Amendment is that section that pertains to us in the industry that we're into of that, uh, that uh, Paris Accord part of it, okay? This was proposed by the EPA. The top of the bar above the dark blue is the refrigerants we use uh, today at the bottom is the likely alternatives, Emerson's perspective. Again, we don't have any ties to any refrigerant, obviously. And this here, this red box is, uh, it has not been SNAP approved or disapproved or banned. And we'll talk a little bit more SNAP about SNAP down the way here. Uh, US EPA actions on HFC is a significant uh, new alternative po policy or SNAP as we call it, uh, SNAP run rule 20 and 21 were vacated at the federal level, again, the Paris Accord part, and the original ruling banned the use of certain GWPs, HFCs, okay? Um, obviously, that was turned down. Um, it was not affected by the 608, and it was removed because it pertained to ozone depleting refrigerants, and it was fought in the courts. So California came along, and they're leading the way, and they stuck with their guns and the SNAP rule 2021, and CARB, if you will, uh, California Air Resources Board, uh, continued on with what we were gonna do as a nation in January 2019. Uh, and it talks about the manufacturers and what they can do and what they can't do, what contractors can do and they can't do. And this is ever changing. I just got some information from Jen and CARB this morning uh, where some of my slides were even dated by a few months that things are changing that fast. And it talks about at the bottom here of New York and Maryland, Connecticut, and New Jersey, 
have also announced plans to adopt SNAP 2021. That has already happened, by the way. Okay, that is already in in in, in play. And uh, New Jersey just signed, I believe, a few weeks ago. So this is a very new slide. And this is U.S. lax federal HFC regulations. So we're going state by state as we talked about. Okay, uh, there is a there's been a uh, U.S. Climate Alliance uh, for some time, but now that alliance is coming in alliance where, when California started out, um, other states like Washington, Oregon, New York, if memory serves me right, adopted what California was doing. And basically, the long and short of it is manufacturers were going to have a heck of a time trying to send certain equipment to across state lines. So the goal here is to try to get as many states on the same page and do it at a state level instead of a federal level. And when it started, it was rather slow, and it has since snowballed. As of three weeks ago, we have 25 uh, states, members, and growing. Eight states have joined this year and now make up 55% of the population and 11.7 trillion parts of the economy, okay? Four states down here have adopted the U.S. EPA SNAP 2021. Again, that's California, Washington, Vermont, and New Jersey. And this is allows for additional removal of substitutes or use conditions based to the risk and human health in the environment. And you can see what's going on here. Currently, no action, uh, very few. SNAP 2021 in gray. The adopted uh, recently, Washington, if you pay attention to what's going on, I know most of you do, um, they've just adopted or they're going into where they're going to start implementing their building codes and their fire departments for A2Ls, which is a mildly flaming refrigerants, which we will see a lot of in the near future. I don't expect you to read this. Uh, what I want to talk about here is I've got another slide that blows up. This is one of them that I just recently got from Jen. Uh, and it talks about the top of it, um, the EPA SNAP Rule 20, uh, supermarkets, remote uh, condensing units, and standalone, and then the EPA SNAP rules over here. And it has all the states and what they're doing. It's rather small. So I'll show you. Um, here. I'll blow this up here. And it just shows you when it's going to go into play a state by state adoption of the EPA SNAP Rule 2021. So this is ever changing. When I first started almost three years ago, this was already in play, this particular slide. And I don't know how many times we've changed this over the months that I've been here. So stay tuned uh, on all of this. Again, they just pushed what should have been back in December. They pushed it back to July. And that's subject to change now with what's going on in the nation right now with the COVID-19. Um, CARB worked closely with the stakeholders to revise proposals. Uh, the CARB proposed HFC reduction. New systems less than 150 GWP. That means any refrigerant with less than, uh, uh, you have to have uh, 150 global warming potential and new construction remodels and existing facilities. I'm going to talk about what that means to you as a wholesaler, as a contractor, what it means to us at Emerson here in a little bit. Uh, hurdles, some of the hurdles, the existing stores, less than 150 GWP. What about the cost, logistics, the capital cost for the thresholder? And then what's that look like for the end user uh, and, and what they're going to do? What's that going to look like in downtime for them, the product and changeovers? That's a big concern. I know the first uh, CO2 class we gave in Atlanta a couple of years ago in 2019, it was the day after AHR in Atlanta. And to my surprise, there wasn't one contractor in that class. And uh, Andre came along and said in the in the class, because it was the first time Trevor and I had delivered that class with the trainer on our own, and uh, he was there as a safety net. But what I saw was his end users in the class. There was about 20 people, and most of the people were store owners, people that own stores, because they were trying to figure out, are they, you know, are they preparing for today, or are they preparing for 10 years from now, and what that looks like. The bottom line is folks um, folks are just tired of changing refrigerants all the time, so they're looking for an alternative that may not have to be changed for the future. So to bring this to a head, the U.S. HFC phase down, again, it is a phase down, not a phase out. Uh, this is what we call the American Innovation and Manufacturer, or the AIM Leadership Act of 2020. 
introduced by the representatives. I'm not going to go through all of this, but it just tells you where they're going with this at. This was just updated this morning. Again, air conditioning, this is the pending carb rulemaking. I moved that, that underneath the air conditioning where it says AC will begin first. And if Ed's on the line, they know this already out in California as, as well as anyone. Uh, the board meeting and final regulation is scheduled for July of 2020. Uh, and that's depending on this COVID-19. Uh, just so you know, that date was uh, December 20, 2019, 2019. So, and this just talks about basically what refrigerants are gonna be used, what their global warming potential has to be and how large the system is. So the bottom line is the larger the system, the supermarkets, uh, the less global warming potential refrigerant can be in there. So that's why CO2 is being looked at uh, so heavily right now with supermarkets because of the allowance of what the global warming potential has to be, okay? Commercial refrigeration will follow AC. Uh, the more board meeting again is in 2020, uh, July of 2020. The effective is 2022, again, less than 150. And on stationary refrigeration, no more than uh, greater than 50 pounds, okay? Over here, it was suggested to me this morning to remove anything in this line. Uh, there was a lot of verbiage there at one time, but now it's pretty much stay tuned for updates. They backed off of that for now. Okay, likely refrigerant and alternatives. Now, I'm gonna start out with these squares at the bottom. Again, some of this might be refresher use, some of this might be brand new. So let's start with the boxes up above. The green box indicates A1 refrigerants, okay? A standing for the toxicity. A means non-toxic, no toxicity, or low toxicity. The one is the flammability. So in this case, the one stands for non-flammable, okay? So we've got A1s, A2Ls are the new kids on the block. It's a non-toxic, mildly flammable refrigerant. And then we have A3, which is good old propane over here, R290, and we're seeing a lot of that right now. And then we have blue, the ammonia. Uh, it is toxic, and it is also mildly flammable. Now, we say non-toxic, but in enough parts per million, somewhere around 15,000, uh, CO2 can be toxic. It needs to be ventilated in a closed environment. So as you move from right to left, here's where we're at now. Here's where we're headed to. We're already manufacturing these refrigerants and out in the use. And here's where we're heading for quite quickly right here. I added 454B. As some of you may know or may not know, about six months ago, Carrier announced their go-to for 410A, and that is going to be 454B made by Comores. That'll go into effect on all their residential and light commercial in uh, 2023. And then we have Utopia, if you will, the perfect, uh, the perfect uh, refrigerants, if you will, the uh, natural refrigerants, CO2, 290, and ammonia. Okay, at the bottom, you'll see the global warming potential. Again, obviously, this is bad. What does that mean to you and I? It's the difference of something breaking up in 11 years or 11 days. And I'm just using that as an analogy. Those aren't real numbers, okay? This is in production, as I said. I threw this slide in there because I think it's a, a good visual for students when I teach this. Uh, one ton of CO2, just to wrap your head around this, is the equivalent of eight ounces of 404A, okay? One ton of CO2 is the equivalent of eight ounces of 404A. And the global warming potential for 404A, which is on the chopping block almost everywhere, already in California, um, is 3,922, somewhere thereabouts or close to, okay? So keep that in mind. So moving to this slide, this is a slide that Rajan actually developed uh, 10 years ago approximately, and it's used worldwide. It's seen as a very use, useful tool. Um, I've been told that they've even, even seen it in Chinese. Okay, so again, everything on the left-hand side is is where we'd like to be, okay? The farther to the left, the global warming potential lessens. And here's where we are using the greens here right now. See 404A, again, this is a very qualitative chart. It's not the scale. If it was, this would be completely off the screen. 
Over here to the left, these lines, these gray lines divide up the pressures. This is a low temperature, low pressure here. And between these two lines is the medium, and this is high, okay? And above that is CO2. And I wanna point out is the CO2 in transcritical because there is a difference in the subcritical and transcritical, okay? And these are the refrigerants that everything to the right are similar to. Now, when we look at this, some of these refrigerants are foreign to us, like R32, we're starting to see in our PTEC units and window units. And what I try to do with students is, is point out to them that they're already using R32 and they don't even need, know it in, in a roundabout way. If they've used 410A, they've already worked around R32. And what I mean by that is 410A is made up of two refrigerants, two blends or two refrigerants components. And one of those is R32 and the other one's R125. And R125, the only reason we use that is it's a fire deterrent. But unfortunately, when we add R125, you can see what it does to the global warming potential, okay? By re removing it and bringing it back to its pure form, R32 is not as high in global warming potential, but it's mildly flammable. Asia never did use R410A. They went right to R32. Another one I like to point out is this 1234YF. This is gonna be seen in a lot of your new blends coming up, your HFOs. Uh, and you're already seeing this if you're an automobile buff. This is what's replacing the 134A in all your cars, okay? So again, I wanna point out to you, how do we get these numbers? Because that confused me when I first started working under uh, my mentor, one of my many mentors, Andre. What does that global warming potential number mean? So I usually only have about eight hours in front of a class to teach them something. Um, so let's do it this way. It's a ratio and everything's based off of CO2 and they've given the number one to CO2. Okay, so CO2 starts, we needed a starting point and CO2 is in the air. So they gave it the number one. So in other words, when we come over here, it takes 3,922 pounds of CO2 to the equivalent of one pound of 404A. So it's a ratio, everything's ratio compared to CO2. So it's one to whatever this number is, that's how many pounds of damage it does or how long it stays into the, uh, the atmosphere, okay? This is the refrigerants we're using today. Here's the things that we're manufacturing now. Here's where we'd like to be one day. And the HFOs is gonna be our playground uh, for a lot of things in the near future, okay? This is where we're gonna see a lot of action at, okay? the 513s and the different refrigerants that we're working on right now. You can see where 513A is right here. And again, you can see where we're trying to get underneath that 750. That's gonna be crucial, uh, but we're gonna step down as slowly. This can't happen overnight. Okay, so I put the questions in there. I'm not sure, Julie, if you wanna ask any questions or we just wanna go right into the CO2 now. Just head into the CO2. Okay, CO2 peculiarities and terminology. Sorry one. about that. I, I had to get had to get myself off of mute. Um, I, so let me check here and see if there are any questions that have come in. Um, and I don't see any yet. If anybody out there has any questions or if they want to make any comments, uh, feel free to to go ahead and just put a comment in there, and I can unmute you. But uh, as of right now, it looks like why don't you just go ahead and proceed and we'll open it up at the end uh, with any other okay. questions. Sounds good. So this slide is telling you, it's just a comparison of CO2 next to HFCs, HCFCs, and on the far right, the impact on 744 systems, okay? So if you see it in red, that means it doesn't do so well, okay? For lack of better terminology, okay? So the global warming potential for CO2, as I said earlier, is one. Over here, we're looking anywhere from 1300, like your R134A is around 1300, or your 404A right around 4000. Ozone depletion potential, zero for CO2 on some of this, uh, zero for HFCs, high for HCFCs, okay? Now here's where we struggle with the CO2. The saturation pressures are high, the operating pressures are high, standstill pressures is high, and if we have a power outage, we got to worry about standstill pressure, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that if we get into the architecture. And again, that's where these shine better than the CO2. But more and more, we're bringing out different things to overcome these problems, these challenges, if you will. Uh, inert gas, pretty much like for like there. 
uh, high ambient performance, it's lower. Uh, volumetric mass flow, heat transfer is lower. We're much better there on the CO2. And I'm not trying to promote CO2. I have no real dog in the fight here. Uh, but I do want to point out later on that it's not just about global warming potential. When we talk about compression ratios, for example, I think Ed talked about it the other day, you know, three to one is uh, usually uh, somewhere around where an air conditioning should be. Uh, medium temperature, good compression ratio is five to one. On low temp is around 10 to one, or roughly, roughly thereabouts. On CO2 and low temperature, the compression ratio is approximately two to one. So just to wrap your head around that, and if you've ever seen a CO2 piston out of a compressor, it's literally about an inch and a half across for a large system. So it's very, very efficient, okay? Uh, the complexity of the system, obviously it's gonna be higher, and the adoption as of right now is low, but this is changing. I can see this being uh, change from low to high in the very near future. In fact, I said earlier we were behind um, Canada for the CO2 uh, transcritical systems or CO2 systems in general than the states. And since in the last five years, we've actually passed Canada uh, for more CO2 systems in the United States than they have, and by far. Um, and I might even have a chart here later on talking about that. Benefits of using CO2 as a refrigerant, CO2 is natural. Uh, global warming potential of one, again, it's non-toxic, non-flammable, non-combustible. It is an expensive refrigerant compared with HCFCs and HFCs. The problem with that is the, pro the growing pains I'm seeing or I'm hearing from traveling around the states is, one, uh, the tanks. The tanks are really expensive. The refrigerant's cheap. Depending on where you're at in the United States, it could be anywhere from a dollar a pound to a dollar fifty, two dollars a pound, okay? And it's only going to go down. It's never going to get more expensive that I can see, okay? But the cost of the tanks renting those out and then the storage of it, the wholesalers, as most of you that are on the line can verify, is they're not used to being in that world, okay? That's usually your prax airs, your different ones. So that was the challenge of getting enough uh, CO2 out to the people that are building this, um, you know, doing these projects. I know I heard a lot about that in California from contractors I did a class up in Sacramento, and they landed the biggest job in the nation in Southern California. And uh, the biggest complaint they had was is they couldn't get enough refrigerant to the job site. And secondly, they were having trouble with their XHP, which is a extra high pressure copper by Mueller um, when they get into transcritical. It's not just stainless steel anymore. But it is the better heat transfer properties compared to conventional refrigerants and more than 50% reduction in HFC refrigerant charge possible. The CO2 lines are typically one to two size smaller than traditional DX piping systems, and it's an excellent material compatibility. Uh, the performance equivalent or better than HFCs and the atmosphere comprises of about 0.04% of CO2 or 402 parts per million. Uh, here's where we get into some of the good stuff. The CO2 temperature at atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure being 14.7 standard, it's a minus 109. So that's huge. You're going to see a lot of weird things here with CO2. This is where it gets kind of scary for contractors like myself and others. You have to get them to wrap their head around there. The critical temperature is 87.8. And we don't talk about critical temperature with other refrigerants because you can see why. Uh, critical temperature just means when this gets above 87.8 outside ambient air, the CO2 is neither a liquid or a vapor. PT charts do not mean anything anymore. It becomes what we call a fluid, a transcritical or supercritical fluid, okay? So we've always had a critical temperature for all refrigerants, but for 404A, for example, we're never going to see 161 degrees on the face of the earth, or we hope not. Okay, so we just don't talk about it. So it has a very low critical point. Uh, the critical pressure at that critical temperature is 1,056, and that scares the heck out of people, right? What I always try to do is when I, I to take the fear factor out of it, I start with subcritical as CO2. So as long as it's below this critical temperature, we're talking about pressures and temperatures no higher than 410A in the air conditioning mode, okay? So that eases their pain to try to wrap their head. It's not until we get above this temperature that it changes a lot for us and we start seeing 1,200, 1,400, and we'll talk a little more about that as we move along. 
the triple point, we have a very high triple point pressure, okay? It's at 61 PSIG. Again, all refrigerants have a triple point, but we don't discuss it. Why, why does that matter? Because this is where solid, liquid, and vapor meet, okay? And you can't charge a CO2 system around 61 PSIG in the liquid state. It has to be vapor for fear that you, if it gets exposed, you're gonna have dry ice, okay? So what most contractors are doing, they're not going real tight around that 61 PSIG. They're charging it with vapor up to around 100, 140, somewhere there about, and then they're going in with liquid to take out that possibility of that danger of getting some dry ice in there. And that's what we do on our trainers also. After we're done with the training, we blow the charge and we keep about 100 pounds on the trainer uh, so we don't have to pump it down or vacuum and clean it up after to the next um, to the next class, okay? Yeah, at the bottom, again, you can see where we're shining with that global warm potential. Uh, to look at global uh, next to the properties of 404A comparison, temperature at atmospheric pressure, again, minus 109. The critical temperature, again, 87.8. That's big. I always quiz people on that one. That's one I need. They need to know at the top of that thumbprint or that enthalpy chart. Uh, the critical pressure is 1056. Again, the triple, triple point pressure is 61. Again, we need to talk about these two, the 61 and the, the critical temperature and the triple point pressure, because those are crucial in how we're charging and how our system changes, okay? Pressure at saturated temperature is 815. Here's a big one, too. Um, I slid this in. Again, these, this is a hodgepodge of different slides to try to make an easy transition. It wasn't that easy to do, but I tried my best. I'm kind of jumping around from different uh, departments here, but I thought this was important for everyone on the line to understand. CO2 expands 845 times going from a solid to a gas. It sublimes, so it never sees liquid. It goes from a solid to a gas. One of the, uh, the exercises we do or visuals we do in class when we travel is we have three Tupperware dishes out there and we put one cube of CO2 or solid ice, dry ice in one, two in the other, and three in the other. We've snapped the lids down there and it pops the lids off simultaneously with, with, the, with the, the lesser of the, uh, the, uh, the, the dry ice going last, if you will. And the reason what we're trying to point out to them is how fast this expands if it was in your truck or if it was standstill pressure in a system that lost power. What does that look like to the contractor? We're going to have to have a generator. You're going to have to have a condenser cooling down uh, that receiver, that, that uh, flash tank. So again, one liter of dry ice will produce 185, uh, 845 liters of gas. So the way the visual I get on that is if you had a one liter or two liter of dry ice, solid dry ice, it will multiply to 845 one liters of vapor, okay? And it does it very, very quickly. The density compared to air is 1.52. So you're gonna see your leak detection device is somewhere around 18 inches off the ground. By the way, this is the same weight, ironically, the exact same weight of propane. I know when I was installing uh, gas lines with natural gas, we worried about the codes, the windows above, three foot diagonally above a window. In propane, we worried about basement windows. If there was a basement involved by code, we had to be a certain distance of that. So just a fun fact. So what that looks like for 290 or CO2, you may see contractors going into mechanical rooms wearing something strapped around their knee or their ankle, uh, especially in 290, uh, the flammability that A3. Dry ice is formed uh, solid. Uh, when it bl dropped below the uh, triple point, again, the triple point being that 61 PSIG. Uh, triple point occurs at the 4.2 bar or 61 PSIG, as I talked about. Deposition, the definition is dry ice formation. And sublimation, again, is the conversion of a solid to a gas, bypassing that liquid, okay? Again, the ratio is 1 to 845 times from a solid to a vapor. Pressure temperature relations. This is a good chart here. This is a pressure temperature relations of various refrigerants. Let's look at 134A. Again, we don't talk about the triple point. Look where atmospheric pressure is. Look how low it is down here. 404A and 717, obviously. And then we've got good old CO2 here. 
see how high the triple point is and how low that uh, the, uh, the uh, critical point is, a very small window uh, for that CO2. So that's a big change there and things we need to be aware about on those temperatures. Walk through these charts. Here we got some enthalpy charts on the top. We've got our liquid and our, our gas. Most of you know how to read this here. Um, here we talk about, here's our subcritical. Again, we're below that 87.8 right there at the top of our thumbprint, at the top of that chart, okay? And we'll go across. For those of you that don't know this that are on the line, and most of you probably do, I know there's some engineers on the line, a lot of intel, highly intelligent Emerson folks that I've met along the way. Um, when you look at an enthalpy chart, I always try to teach students this. It's a very generic way, but this is the compressor uh, line. When you're coming across here, this is your condenser line. When you hit here, when you're going down, uh, down vertically here, that's your metering device, and when you're coming across here, that's your evaporator. Here's our two-phase area inside there, okay? This would be your, uh, your, your, your dew point, and here's what we would talk about, or pardon me, dew point here and your bubble point over here, pardon me. Okay, so this is in subcritical. We're down here. This is a normal system, what we'd normally see. Here is a transcritical system, the same system. Okay, when we talk about transcritical booster, we're talking about a system that only has CO2 in it. It's also a shared refrigerant line with the medium and low temperature is one suction header, okay, uh, going into all these different pressures going into one header, all right? This is where pushing it, and sometimes we purposely push this into transcritical by our discharge pressures, um, kind of uh, dialing that down, if you will, to, they utilize it for, um, for, uh, for, for hot water and things like that, where we use like, uh, oh, um, um, like geothermal does uh, for your uh, GWPs or your, your um, uh, what am I trying to say, reclaim, heat reclaim, water reclaim, and those kind of things. A lot of systems like in Canada will, auto, will try to push it in transcritical uh, purposely to uh, use that for hot water, okay? And then we have the system here uh, where it uh, starts out at the subcritical and, again, goes to the transcritical. Uh, this just shows, again, the same thing we just talked about, and this is a book that Emerson has. If you want to learn a lot about uh, CO2 or the basics of CO2, this book that was developed by Emerson and probably Andre was involved, I'm sure, uh, was just a lot of information. I gained a lot of knowledge here a few years ago just by reading that book, okay? And you can Google that. Uh, word for word what that book says and it comes right up for you, okay? Liquid and gas density are the same only at the critical point, okay? After that, again, it's a supercritical fluid. It's neither a vapor or a liquid, and that's crucial to understand that. Um, when we get up there, I'm not probably going to get into it today, but our condenser turns into a gas cooler because the refrigerant can't condense, but I'm not going to go there right now. We don't have time. And here again, this is what I was talking about earlier, about pushing that up into the transcritical state purposely to get that uh, reclaim, extra reclaim, especially like fish markets, a uh, place where they work food and they use a lot of hot water, okay? This just shows the climate impact of CO2 systems. The two blue lines here are becoming closer and closer as we move along. Uh, we'll call that the equator line, if you will. We're getting to adiabatic coolers, uh, some uh, brace plate heat exchangers uh, to cool the refrigerant down. And a lot of things are going on right now. In fact, we, Emerson helped uh, install a system down in Atlanta a few years back, and it does quite well. And it's a transcritical system, and they use adiabatic coolers, okay? Uh, this just shows the European market, the CO2 market. The thing I like to point out here is look at Japan on a whole as the world. Japan, unlike the U.S. or some countries that like to slap the hand or fine or penalize for not doing the right thing, Japan actually gives what I will call rebates, incentives to install CO2 systems, okay? In fact, I've been told that there, it's such a great program that by the time you're done installing it, the contractor that is, you actually kind of make money on it, okay? Also, Japan already has residential CO2 systems. Uh, just so you know, okay? Questions on that? All right, let's talk about, and I think we're going to have a little time for some architecture, if you don't mind, Julie. 
No, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I don't really have any questions that have come up. I did have one person asking <clears throat> to go over the products that is off, that are offered by Copeland for CO2. That may be something that we'll have to do in a future class. So, you know, kind of a quick review of our product lineup. Um, so I don't know if that's anything that you can cover or if we would need to get one of the, the product managers to review that. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I actually slipped a couple slides in here at the bottom. Oh, that perfect. I did. So let's, yeah, right here. Uh, it's some <laughs> of the, I slipped it in last night. This is just, and then, again, this is a very generic uh, form. I only put two slides in there, but this just shows you a quick snapshot of uh, some of our offerings at Emerson here and what we have out there. So this has all been CO2 approved, and I apologize. I didn't catch that slip down on me. Uh, but we can talk about that. Someone probably can talk about that better than I can, but this is what we, you know, this is the only thing I grabbed last night. Um, uh, but I'm going to go back to the architecture real quick here, and if we get to that, we can talk a little more. Um, I want to talk about, just for the sake of people having a better understanding at the counters, so we have CO2 system architecture, secondary versus cascade versus booster. We all understand what cascade is. Secondary is nothing more than meaning that we have a fluid down here, typically glycol. In this case, we're going to look at CO2 as that bottom. I threw some numbers in here. Uh, let's imagine this is around minus 20. Uh, just to show you how efficient CO2 is, not just as a gas or a refrigerant, but as a liquid. Unlike glycol, it is very volatile, okay? So what I mean by that is it will actually not just pick up sensible heat as glycol does, it actually picks up latent heat. And we talk about the energy. I talked about the piston size earlier. When we're talking about a pump size that we would use to pump this liquid, we're actually using for CO2 about a tenth of the horsepower we would use for glycol. Very, very efficient refrigerant, okay? So at the top, we might see ammonia, we might see 290, or an HFC up here in our DX system at the top. Obviously, this is a brace plate heat exchanger, or some type of heat exchanger that's removing our heat from our low temperature at the bottom, okay? And you'll notice in a lot of these architectures, CO2 is always in the low because it doesn't see that outside ambient. We're removing the heat right here with this brace plate heat exchanger. Therefore, it does real well below 87.8 as long as we can keep that cooled down, okay? This just shows that CO2 is a secondary system again, okay? Um, I put this in here. For one reason, one reason only, I crunched some numbers sometime back to show in class, CO2 secondary is far more efficient than glycol. Depending on the temperature, you may remove as much as 100 to 130 BTUs per pound of latent compared to glycol at 0.8 BTUs per pound. So that's a big difference there. So again, we're not just talking about, you know, the tree huggers, the going, you know, going green people. Uh, you know, it, right or wrong or indifferent, whatever side of the fence you're on in that, we're talking about good quality, efficient refrigerant. CO2 is very, very good refrigerant. And again, with the way these rulings are going right now, with how low the global warming potential has to be in these very large systems, i.e. supermarkets, CO2 is going to be the playground for most everyone, if not all, uh, supermarkets as it sits right now, okay? Cascade systems, again, this is very condensed. Let's take a look at some of these. We're talking about a simple cascade. We would use a HFC or ammonia at the top. The low stage would be CO2. Again, this is a TXV system down here. We're removing our heat with the HFC. This is the most popular of all the CO2 systems right now in the, in the more, the hotter states, if you will, uh, because it's a nice way to get into the program kind of stick your toe in and feel the water out before you actually go full-blown CO2. This could obviously be changed one day up above, but this gives a nice alternative. Again, the CO2 is not seen outside ambient up here at the condenser. It's removing the heat right here with this heat exchanger, okay? The low stage provides the cooling load. It uses CO2, and it's always subcritical. Anytime we're below that 87.8, uh, that we're in subcritical state, okay, and there's no fear there. Uh, high stage absorbs heat from the condenser CO2 and the cascade. Uh, let's talk about the transcritical. This is the new kid on the block, if you will. Again, when we talk about transcritical booster CO2, we're talking about the whole system, medium and low, 
all being CO2, going into one suction header. It was designed to do this. We're not surprised when it goes into transcritical. That's what it was made to do, okay? Uh, when we talk about transcritical, uh, some of the things we're going to need will not be mechanical. We're going to be, everything's modulating. CO2 is very hyperactive, so you're going to see a lot more electronics involved. Uh, you can see some of the high pressure controls. Two of the things I like to point out if we have time here is that you're going to see uh, everything in red, by the way, is in transcritical. So when you leave the medium temperature MT compressors, you're going to be very high pressures, 12, 1400, somewhere they're about, okay? And that's just a rough guesstimate here, okay? So that's either going to be stainless steel or a very high pressure copper, XHP copper, okay? Again, this condenser is now a gas cooler. We're removing heat. The refrigerant can't be condensed now. Again, we're a supercritical fluid. This is a new device here you're going to see on a CO2 system, a transcritical system, a high pressure valve. So this high pressure valve is holding the pressure back depending on the temperature out here. So it's reading with our controls here in a normal subcritical state, it's reading subcooling and taking that information back to the E2. It's reading our subcooling. When it goes into transcritical, it's reading our COP back to our compressors here and it's controlling the pressure here. If that pressure gets out of control, we're trying to keep this flash tank stable let's say at 35 degrees or somewhere thereabouts, 450, 500 PSIG. This flash tank is nothing more than a receiver, if you will, just a thicker walled receiver. And we're trying to keep this stable as best as we can. So we added a bypass valve here. And if it gets to a certain above a pressure, let's say 500, and I'm just using that as an example, it relieves some of that pressure off there and dumps it into the header, bypassing it. So by keeping this stable, we have a nice column of fluid going into our metering devices down here in the medium low temperature, okay? So again, you're gonna see a lot of controls, uh, electronic controls, okay? You're gonna have EEVs, uh, everything's gonna be modulating. It moves very, very quick. Uh, let's take a look at some of these pressures. You're gonna have a pressure relief valve throughout the whole system. Anywhere we can trap liquid refrigerant and expanding, again, that 845, uh, compared to one ratio, we're going to need to vent this out, uh, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean anyone's going to get hurt necessarily. The downside of it is is blowing the charge. We don't want to do that. That's when I, when I talked about earlier having a, a uh, generator or condenser to cool this flash tank. We need to cool this to keep that temperature down so it doesn't rise, okay? Uh, but you can see where these might be at, and I just, just uh, threw this slide in to give you some examples. Uh, the compressor discharge somewhere around uh, 1958, I believe, roughly there. Some uh, you might want to check my numbers there on that. That might be different. It's built into that empty compressor. By the way, that pressure relief valve is in the compressor. Okay, and this just shows you where that gas could be trapped at in liquid, where we shut those uh, EEVs off and trap that liquid. We have to have some way of releasing that off. I'm going to walk through this. This will probably be the last slide. I like to use this slide, especially with, uh, I really love this slide the first time I saw it, because it's a nice way of showing, again, enthalpy charts. So let's walk through this here. Again, where the compressor is, to the left, you'll see the system. On the right, you'll see the actual enthalpy chart. So again, that's our compressor line going up. As we come across our condenser, everything in red, again, is transcritical with really high pressures. As we hit our high pressure valve, we're going to go down. It's acting as a metering device, so therefore it's going to go vertically down through our flash tank. We're cooling down, it's, and we're releasing that. We're cooling it down, so we're releasing temperature. It's going to act as a condenser, if you will, on our chart, our enthalpy chart. We go down through our metering devices on the medium temperature, go across through that medium evaporator, down through our metering device on our low temperature, across. They are completely out to our header, and then through our evaporator on a low temperature, up through our scrolls, our low temperature scrolls, and up through those condensers. Notice that we have three different pressures going into this one header, uh, at all CO2, okay? And uh, that's probably going to be all the time I've got, uh, um, uh, Julie. No, that, that was great, um, Don. I really appreciate it. 
I'm going to go ahead actually uh, and unmute Mark Walzak um, and Mark Hayes and Mike Nipper, uh, the, the three sales directors from our uh, from the aftermarket here, in case any of them want to chime in. But I, I did note um, in the chat, we will send out a link to the Commercial CO2 Refrigeration Systems book when we send out this recorded webinar link. Um, oh, Mark Walzak. Mark Walzak, you had some comments about sharing this uh, potentially with yeah, some customers I, or contractors? Yeah, I would think that this would be something great for you guys to do a mailing onto your customer base, whether it's supermarkets, guys, or industrial, to give them the recording and the slides and send it out as a, as a mailing to them. It could be a training for their people. We could do it online for them or, you know, you guys send that out along with that, that uh, booklet that Julie was talking about. I think it's great information. I, I'm not as up on the CO2 as I should be, and this was for me. It's a, it, it was a great kind of basics to put to go through that stuff, and I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's a great idea, Mark. And and I don't know if any of you RSES members out there, and I, I don't know who's on on the line, but I am. Uh, wrote an article for RSES that was out in January, and it got uh, pretty good reviews. And it was a little longer version of this, but very, very. Uh, generic, if you will, just kind of terminology and what have you. But thanks, Mark. Don, if you can send me a link to that article, we'll also include that in the mailing. Yeah, absolutely. Be perfect. All right, everyone. Um, I, I don't know if, if there were, I don't think there were any other comments that came in. Um, I would like to, to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we will be back at it tomorrow. I'm not entirely sure what the topic will be. Don, have you picked out the topic for tomorrow? Um, you know, I think we were going to talk about, I think the polls showed that the next highest percentage was, uh, I think it was causes and corrections of, uh, of compressor failures, I believe. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So keep that in mind as uh, you'll get an invitation to this, um, to, the, to the session for tomorrow. And feel free to forward that on to anybody in your organization or any of your customers that you think would uh, would need to sit through that training. Um, again, thank everybody. Thank you for, uh, for dialing in. Don, thank you very much. Uh, and we will see you all again tomorrow. Take Thanks care. Thanks, everyone. Great job, Don.